Let's bring in Kent Stone, a Hamilton Coalition to Stop the Boar, who joins us from Hamilton, Ontario. Kent Stone, welcome. Uh, we also have Sarah Flounders, co-director with the International Action Center, joining us from New York. I'm going to start with you, Kent Stone. Uh, we're, we're having the Iranian president um, make a statement that has been made before, but he is uh, the 13th government, somewhat still new, but making the motto that we are going to enhance our bilateral ties with each and every country in the region of which it seems like you have uh, also the, his uh, Qatari um, official confirming that. Uh, and this is in reference at the top of the list to obviously the United States. Do you think that uh, the U.S. will get the message when you have regional countries uh, aligning themselves with each other to establish security? Yes, I do think that the U.S. will get the message, but uh, will they act upon it? That's another story. Um, the U.S. Uh, have, and its NATO allies, including, unfortunately, Canada, ha have a colonial mentality, colonial mentality, which they drag with them like a big, great big steamer trunk everywhere they go. And uh, the U.S. tends to think of uh, uh, the Middle East as its backyard, as its sphere of influence. And uh, they have uh, intervened uh, for decades in the Middle East. Uh, in a most uh, arrogant and cruel way, uh, ignoring the national sovereignty and territorial integrity of many countries, starting from Iran back in 1953, um, uh, to the Palestinians continuously since 48, uh, to Afghanistan, to Syria, to uh, Libya, to Ar Iraq. Um, the, uh, the, the role of the U.S. and its uh, coalition partners um, has been very damaging, and the uh, Ir Iranian uh, uh, prime minister, the Iranian uh, prime minister is absolutely correct, I should say president, is absolutely correct in saying that rather than be dominated by the arrogant U.S. empire and its allies, uh, Iran prefers to work with regional partners such as Qatar, Syria, Iraq, uh, Yemen, and other countries. Um, I uh, would like to uh, also go on uh, and talk about uh, the not only the interventions that those countries made, but about the sanctions, the uh, economic war that's being waged on any country in the Middle East, such as Iran, under Trump's maximum strategy policy, uh, concerning the, uh, the economic sanctions. But I think my colleague uh, and the other guest on the show, uh, Ms. Sarah Flounders, will probably have a lot to say about that. Go ahead, if you have a lot to say about that, Sarah Flounders. Well, uh, first of all, I couldn't agree with Ken Stone more. This is a colonial mentality. And... Uh, Certainly, the United States knows that every country in the region wants them out. Uh, and Iran has every right to open up bilateral relations with each country. Uh, and many countries literally need it for survival, because one by one, U.S. policy is to divide them, to sanction them, to separate them from each other, to try to uh, impoverish the entire region uh, to make each country dependent on U.S. imperialism and its allies. And when you consider uh, U.S. sanctions on Iran, but also on Iraq, on Syria, on Lebanon, Yemen, into the Horn of Africa, Ethiopia, Eritrea, Sudan, South Sudan, uh, regionally, this is the big problem that every country uh, is uh, under attack, is under sanctions, is under U.S. bases, naval bases, military bases uh, in the region. So that resistance is growing, and uh, Iran is a force for stability in the region. You know, something very interesting happened uh, recently, Ken Stone, and that was when you had the um, uh, UAE foreign minister visit Syria. Uh, and you also have Saudi Arabia that is uh, in this rapprochement phase with Syria, uh, not to mention also with Iran. So we're seeing the change in dynamics, and uh, it's uh, actually in a um, faster gear, if I might say, 
with the Iranian president, Ebrahim Raisi. So doesn't that change uh, the calculations, or shouldn't it change the calculations of the U.S. when it comes to this region, and then by default of Israel when it comes to these countries? Because we know that Israel bombs Syria rather uh, uh, repeatedly. It should change the calculations for the uh, U.S., and it should change the calculations for Israel. And um, I think that um, the uh, calculation is that the, uh, the U.S. may have overreached uh, its uh, imperial uh, boundaries or in, uh, in its um, desperate and chaotic retreat from uh, Afghanistan. And I think that the, uh, the fact that the U.S. Um, has also lost uh, its uh, regime change war in Syria, though it still occupies the eastern third of Syria, and the fact that it's losing alongside the uh, Saudi coalition its war against Yemen, as the people of Yemen uh, are taking the war right back into the UAE and into Saudi Arabia. Um, I think the U.S. is probably, they're probably burning the midnight oil in the Pentagon or in the State Department there, trying to figure out how they are going to uh, manage to keep, um, keep the, a, a presence, if at all, in the, in the Middle East, while at the same time uh, pivoting to Asia, that is to say threatening China, and, de and, and saber rattling in the Ukraine, and, you know, building up forces in Eastern Europe. Uh, I think the U.S. can't handle all this at once, and something's got to give. And what I'm hoping is that the U.S. will see the light uh, soon and decide to make a strategic withdrawal right out of Iraq, right out of Syria, uh, leave Lebanon alone, and uh, pull out its forces of, as, as tr uh, Biden promised last February from the Saudi coalition. That would be the smart thing to do. Cut their losses, get out, and, uh, and reorder their, themselves. But I'm not sure that, that they will. I'm just hoping that they will. And that's the thing that they should do, um, because they are going to be pushed out anyway. The resistance in Iraq is lobbing missiles into the green zone in Baghdad and attacking US convoys. The, in, in Syria, the, uh, the, there are attacks on the U.S. bases that they have Ill illegally built there. In, uh, in Yemen, the people are, uh, the, the Ansarallah movement is carrying the fight right into Saudi Arabia and the UAE. I think the tide is turning, and uh, I think that the resistance will win, and the U.S. will be forced to leave the Middle East as um, the uh, Iranian general, uh, Qasem Soleimani, who was martyred two years ago, was trying to do. And I think that the assa his assassination two years ago sure. is, has accelerated the process. Yeah, and to, to put all of that um, into uh, one uh, um, a plate, Sarah Flounder, so to speak, you have another occurrence that has happened, uh, which adds, um, I think, another dimension to this in terms of the U.S. forcing itself in the region. And that was when you had these uh, naval military drills that happened between Russia, China, and Iran. And I believe this is a message that's being sent, this trilateral alliance to the U.S., because it's obviously in a crisis mode with Russia. It has pivoted towards China. And maybe I'm asking you, is that a message to the U.S. that, you know, your time is up? Because in the, all the other things that Ken Stone said, you know, they're being uh, obviously retaliated against. Well, there couldn't be a clearer way to send a message to get the attention of the Pentagon war planners than the joint military exercises, Russia, China, Iran, uh, because these are countries that have been able to withstand the complete U.S. takeover of the entire region that are forces of resistance and national sovereignty. Uh, so they're, they're coming together and coordinating their actions at a time when 
the U.S.-NATO alliance is in deep disarray. That's a lot of what is fueling the um, crisis in the Ukraine, how to get everybody on board um, to be the vicious force they've been in the past. They had a complete dis disarray in Afghanistan. It was an absolute humiliation in front of the whole world. Uh, they weren't able to hold on to one base. They weren't even able to get out in an organized way. Uh, and uh, they do know that their days are really limited in Iraq uh, and in Syria. So when you see their disarray and this growing coordination among uh, countries that are determined to pursue their own development, their own sovereignty, and to connect with each other and to connect also with other countries that are sanctioned and are smaller and weaker. When, when Iran sends uh, oil to Syria through to Lebanon, that is a statement of solidarity. But it's all countries so beleaguered, you don't stand alone. Or when Iran sends oil to Venezuela, uh, which allows them to move their oil onto world markets. Uh, so each of these steps, when, when there's coordination with China's Belt and Road uh, program for greater internal infrastructure development, uh, this is a new day. And uh, actually, years ago, I, I believe it was Kissinger who weren't warned that the, I'm sorry, no, it was Zabrinsky, um, that the, the nightmare policy for the United States would be if ever Iran and Russia and China were to come together. So here we see that in this um, military coordination. It's just a beginning step, but it does show there is an understanding that together they can resist and they can help others resist, and uh, ref they're refusing a policy okay. of divide and conquer. So thank you. Sure. Thank you, Sarah Flanders. We appreciate it. Co-director of the International Action Center from New York, Ken Stone, thank you for your contribution. Hamilton Coalition to Stop the War from Hamilton, Ontario. And with that, we come to an end of this news review. Thanks for tuning in.